What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hatnas, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to find magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Judy Wies, and we speak about clean language and what it is that we might call clean facilitation. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you do enjoy the podcast and want to support the production process, visit workshops.work slash support to make a small donation that will make us very happy. Thank you. And now over to the show. Judy, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Yes, finally. You were recommended from so many from so many angles and listeners and other podcast guests that I'm excited to geek out on facilitation with you today and on language and communication. And before getting there, I always start every interview with the same question. When did you start calling yourself a facilitator? And actually, do you? Ooh, I don't always call myself a facilitator. I remember when I first started using the word facilitator in relation to me and the things that I did was probably about 20, 25 years ago. No, not quite as long as that. Anyway. Myself and the group of people who were involved in clean language, we were talking about, because clean language, we'll talk about what clean language is in a little while, but clean language was a thing. It was becoming a thing that more and more people were learning to, to do and to use. And we were trying to work out what should be the name of the qualification we were creating. And we ended up calling it Certified Clean Facilitator. <laughs> and what would be we the didn't difference? Want... What would be the opposite? <laughs> The dirty well, facilitator. <laughs> a, a clean facilitator would be one that is particularly well qualified in creating a space for other people to do their best work mm. and keeping their own stuff to themselves so they don't jump in with their suggestions or advice, but they have some very specific ways of minimizing their own intrusion of content into whatever's happening. But we created this qualification, Certified Clean Facilitator, which was simply a way of saying these people have followed this course and we have, we did these incredibly complex assessments where we observed people working with other people using clean language and, uh, and we ticked all sorts of boxes. It was incredibly resource intensive and I don't know how many people ever got the qualification, but we took it terribly seriously. But we chose facilitator in preference to coach, even though we were talking about one-to-one -one work, because coaches and mentors often regard it as part of their job to give advice and to make suggestions and recommendations and to diagnose, whereas somebody working with clean language would typically not do that. So we thought facilitator was a lovely word for that. And nowadays, of course, facilitator means much more of a group facilitator. But the clean language one-on-one -on -one stuff, facilitator felt like the right word for it back then. And thank you so much for the distinction of and where this is coming from, of the facilitator really being outside of it and rather neutral mm. to facilitate the process of the other person in the group. And what I find fascinating is that it really is in direct opposition to facilitators of certain processes. So when I think, for instance, some facilitators facilitate design thinking. And what I hear is that the different definition of what a facilitator is, where your certification sounds more like the inner work. So how do you train someone to actually really be clean? So to take themselves to leave themselves outside because it means leaving the ego outside it means leaving all your baggage outside and all the triggers so it requires self awareness mm. and it does require process so i think that one of the key distinctions that i i, I like to to make is the distinction between the content and the process mm -hmm. now in theory a design thinking process can be run without the facilitator introducing any content. Mm -hmm. All the ideas or the brilliant inspirational things that the, the group comes up with are entirely theirs. Yeah. 
all that the facilitator is doing is saying, this is our process mm-hmm. for getting to our, our, our prototype or whatever it might be. And similarly, the liberating structures are excellent processes mm-hmm. for getting stuff to happen within groups. The key is that the facilitator is not jumping in and saying, well, I've got a great idea for how you should develop your prototype, or I've got some wonderful ideas and I'm going to put them up on the board before you start your uh, one, two, four, all. Mm -hmm. You just stick with the process. And in the same context, clean language is a process or a set of different processes, in fact, which enable you to engage with your individual or your group that you're working with and really help them do really high quality thinking. And in the context of coaching or, or therapy, to, to sort out their own stuff Yeah. in the context of groups and teams to figure out how to work better together. Yeah. But they're doing the content. The facilitator is doing the process. And before you tell me more about the process, I would like to zoom in to something that you just said is the example of a facilitator or the negative example of a facilitator. Okay, let me share my great ideas. And I think that's the active part of being involved. But then there's a more subtle part that I observe very often in facilitators. It's not actively saying that, but by a certain attitude, judging that the other ideas are not good enough. Mm. And really small things that you might do can let people know that you think that kind of thing. Yes. So, for example, if you're working in the room with a group and you put some stickies high up mm -hmm. and some stickies low down, there's a universal metaphor that mm -hmm. all societies seem to have. I'm not going to say all humans because there are always individual differences. All societies seem to have the same idea that things that are up or higher or bigger are more important than things that are down yeah, and preferred. So up is always preferred to down. Mm -hmm. So where you put a sticky note on a board will have an impact on how people respond to it. And how can you ever avoid that? So this means, I mean, we do have an impact through our actions and words and behavior also. To whom do we do we turn our, so body language, whom do we turn to and face? And then how often do we acknowledge and nod and say, yes, that's a great idea. If we say it once, do we then have to say it to everyone <laughs> or do we say it to no one? And what do we do if we said it once? Is it then a curse? Exactly. And you can't not influence. Yeah. And this is one of the big ideas that I think when I'm talking about clean language, I think this is one of the big ideas where not all clean language facilitators would say this. But I think one of the points about clean language is that you cannot not influence. Mm -hmm. You're always influencing. The only time that two people who are in the same conversation are not influencing each other is if both of them are dead. <laughs> And this is not such an inspiring conversation. No. So you, you can't, I, that that comment came from my clean colleague, Phil Swallow. He, he basically, you can't not influence. But what you can do is be aware of how you're influencing. Mm -hmm. And clean language provides some insights about how your questions will influence, how your body movement will influence, where you place things will influence, and some suggestions for reducing the way you're in introducing your own stuff into those conversations. What it can't do is stop you influencing. Yes. And I think that's also, we don't want to stop influencing because as facilitator, it's also a sort of energy that we bring into the room. That's why groups hire us. And that's mm. why we all have our position in the market, although we mostly do the same activities, but we're different in how we do that. So, yes, we want to influence the group, but hopefully uh, more in an energetic way than in a content way. Yeah. So we might want to influence them to start on time and finish on time, for yes. example. Yeah. We might want to influence them to go through the process in the time allocated. Yeah, to yes and steps. to dare more, to be more mm. creative, maybe. Yeah. We might want to uh, influence the group to listen more carefully to minority voices. 
all these things are perfectly legitimate uses of influence, mm. but just be aware by being aware of how all your various tools of influence, you can do that all of that influencing in a more subtle way. And still, before we come to the process of how to do that, I have another question. Don't worry, we, we may never get to the process, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that. These audience, stay with us, stay with us. As a self-diagnosed overthinker, once I am aware of all these traps of where I put the sticky notes and how I reply to the participants, what is maybe the, the curse then to have too much of this awareness and too much knowledge about all these areas of maybe negative influence and um, go on. and where to draw the line. Yeah. I think that the key is to be aware of what your job is there. Mm -hmm. Why are you in this conversation at all? What are you here for? And keep your eye on that prize. Know what your job is and then, and know that you can't not influence and just keep using what you can to do your job. Mm. And I, yeah, I wonder whether the group will recognize. So if we're authentic and yes, sometimes we nod and we say, yes, good idea. And other times we don't. And I think as long as we don't overemphasize or we don't play that role, maybe the group also will forgive us more mm. or not be impacted that much as if, if we think with every sticky note where to place it on the, on the chart up or down. <laughs> then we might have more of an impact than if we're just doing it almost mindlessly. So some quick tips from the clean language world would be, as a facilitator, don't touch their stickies. Mm. Life can be so easy. Yes, what if it was easy? Don't touch them. Let them move their stickies. Mm. And as a facilitator, don't comment good idea. Just not your thing. Not your job to decide whether an idea is good or not. We know you can't help changing the, you know, your 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 skin tone or whatever may may give you you away, but don't say the words "good idea." Mm. No, let them decide which ideas are good, and instead, ask a question. Mm. Now, questions are hugely influential. The clean language questions are designed to direct an individual or group's attention to what they think is important and to aspects of the stuff that they think is important and to minimize the influence of the facilitator, except by directing attention. So as the facilitator, one of the core jobs that clean language would regard as the facilitator's job is to direct the group's attention. And the best way to direct a group's attention is with questions. What would be an example of a question that corresponds to the clean language as opposed to the same question that would be maybe impacting the group too much or directing them? So I was just thinking, if you were clean language facilitating me just then, you'd have asked me what kind of question mm -hmm. rather than the question that you asked me, which was a much more influential question, which yeah. was to do with uh, give me an example of. Yeah. What would be an example of? Whereas what kind of question leaves the field open for me to say what I think is important about questions? It might be an example, mm -hmm. but it might also be some particular feature of a question. So what kind of is an example of a clean language question? Another clean language question is what would you like to happen or what would you like to have happen is its original format. But when the, when I'm working with the uh, multilingual or multinational groups, I usually shorten that question to what would you like to happen? Because what would you like to have happen is a rather complicated question to translate if you're not a native English speaker. The the tenses are all weird. Yeah. How <laughs> the, long... tenses, the tenses yeah. are all weird because David Grove, the creator of clean language, was a hypnotist. And his interest in hypnotism was absolutely central to the creation of clean language. And that question, and what would you like to have happen, is a really interesting hypnotic question. And uh, if you Google it, you'll, you'll find, I think James Tripp has done a, a, a YouTube video of how that question works from a hypnotic standpoint. But let's just treat it, though, as 
what would you like to happen? So if you went to a group and said, oh, we've got this wall full of ideas. Now, given all of that, what would you like to happen next? And that enables the group to think together about mm. what they would like as a group. And then you might be looking at the the, the wall of stickies and and, uh, and you might ask the non-clean question, are there any of these stickies that need some clarification? And somebody says, oh, I don't understand that one. So, and you go, whose is that one? And yeah, 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 it's mine. So, and it says brilliant idea A. What kind of brilliant idea A is that brilliant idea A? Is there anything else about brilliant idea A? So you're you're just teasing out mm. the thoughts behind what's been done. And you're applying a process, just as you're applying a process in design thinking or you're applying a process in liberating structures, there's a process that we typically use within clean language, which is called the framework for change, that helps to define where we go with what we're doing. So we, now that we you started with process, I will park the other idea and park it right there. It will wait for me. And when you park that idea right there, mm -hmm. is there anything else about that idea? Right there. That we would like to explore now before getting into process. <laughs> the idea right there was related to authenticity and personality. Mm -hmm. So and what I... Authenticity and personality, when it's right there, whereabouts right there is that? You, you gestured over there. Yeah, I, I parked it there so that... I realize sometimes when I have specific areas where I park ideas, I don't forget them because at some point mm -hmm. I will look back there and then they can take it back, even without writing it down. Thank you for that lovely illustration, because one of the things that I learned from clean language, and I don't know that it's really understood in a lot of facilitation training, is that people place their thoughts in the space around them and inside them. Mm -hmm. they Thoughts have location in space. And everybody's particular way of doing it is different, but everybody does it. Mm -hmm. And what can be really interesting is if we all agree to treat our imaginary friends as real. <laughs> and, oh, she's parked it there. Right, we can talk about it because it's there and we can point to it. And that means we can all remember it's there and we can go back to it. Mm. Yeah. Now, one does that as a trainer for all sorts of reasons to help people remember things. But it's also true in ordinary conversation. Mm. People put their thoughts in places and you can talk about, about the thought they've put in a place, even when it isn't represented by a sticky note. Yeah. yeah and I, I started doing that, I think, unconsciously at some point that There's so many tangents coming up in mm -hmm. a conversation that I started parking them. And then and I, by showing it to my conversation partner, they can help me. I'm like, Miriam, what was up there again? <laughs> so. Absolutely. Now get your group doing that. Mm. And it can be really good fun. Yeah. We've got one of those and one of those. And <laughs> get a little bit of stretching as well. <laughs> yeah. So since we're going there, let me take it out and, and put the process to the other side. <laughs> we come to the process. We still have half an hour. Mm -hmm. I can imagine, especially for someone who is rather a quick thinker, and I like to distinguish humans into those who speak to think and those who think to speak. Mm -hmm. I speak to think. So in order to make sense of what's going on in my brain, I have to speak it out. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, now I understand what I mean. And for us, I can imagine that it's very difficult and it requires a lot of self-awareness and self-discipline to learn clean language because we constantly have to hold back. So we want to drive in the fifth gear, but actually we're only allowed in the first gear at the beginning in order to learn that because we have to censor maybe 80% of our words. Mm. How do you keep the balance or how do you train this new way of communication without taking away the beauty of authenticity in the facilitator? So that basically they don't become machines or sound like machines. They don't need to sound like machines at all because the question, when you ask questions from your genuine authentic curiosity, people can tell. 
Mm-hmm. So you don't need, there's no requirement to, to sound like a Dalek when you're asking these questions. But the idea that you only ask these questions, you don't say lots of stuff. You're absolutely right. It is difficult for people who tend to speak to think, to adapt. It's difficult for everybody to adapt because it's it's a different way of doing it. Mm-hmm. Instead of using your spare brain capacity to think about what you think, use your spare brain capacity to think about what they must be thinking. The big question that we're, as clean languages, we're we're considering at the back of our minds all the time is what must be true for them to have said and done that? What must be true for them for them to have said and done that? That's a higher level of empathy. Mm. So you're watching and listening and learning, and you're building your own model of what it must be like to be them. Mm. You hold it very lightly because the next thing they say will will let you know that you've got it wrong. But you're trying to work out what the world must be like from their point of view. David Groves used to ask the question, what must be true for what is there, so what they've said or what they thought, to make sense? Because everybody's inner world makes sense to them. Mm. And for everybody to do what they do makes sense to them. So right now in the news, there are a couple of instances of where people have in America have shot people in situations that from the outside look utterly bizarre. Somebody's shot a child chasing a ball into their garden. And you think, well, what has to be true for that person to have picked up a gun and shot that child. Well, it takes a bit of a challenge to empathize. But what they did made sense to them at the time. Yeah. So you can start to build up an imaginative map of what that might might look like to them. Yeah. Now that that's that's a perhaps quite a challenging one, but it's it's a strong example because it's forcing you to think very differently to how you would normally think. Now as you practice with the big ones like that, then start to work down to the smaller ones. I do an activity with my training groups. I'm teaching people this this stuff. I get everybody to think of a flower. And of course, we all know what a flower is, don't we? Everybody knows what a flower is. So I say, what kind of flower is your flower? And somebody says sunflower. What kind of flower is your flower? And somebody says tulip. What kind of flower is your flower? And somebody says rose. What kind of your flower is your flower? And the next person says rose. They're exactly the same, aren't they? That person is exactly the same as the other person. They both said rose. But then you ask each of them, what kind of rose is your rose? And within one question, you discover that they're different. And this is where the fun starts, because once people start to realize that people who are exactly the same as them five minutes ago are now completely different to them, it makes things much more interesting. Why would you bother being curious about other people if you think they're exactly the same as Mm. you? There's no need. Once you start to realize that everybody's completely different and the world looks completely different, then it's much more fun. And it's worth asking questions about how they're seeing the world. It is more fun, assuming that we do have the open mind to accept and to be confronted with a reality that is not ours. Mm. And I think that's the biggest obstacle to curiosity, that if I ask questions and then suddenly the person who who did shoot the child shares why it makes sense for them, then suddenly this disrupts my worldview. Mm. And this can be very challenging. So I think the lack of curiosity is very often self-defense. Mm. And uh, these questions, the clean language stuff has been used by my colleague Martin Snodden in some of in peace development in mm. some of the most interesting parts of the world. And Martin himself comes from Northern Ireland and was involved in the Troubles way back when directly. And he then moved on to using clean language and other facilitation techniques in South Africa, in uh, Israel-Palestine, in a bunch of interesting places in the world where he was literally working with groups representing both sides of these huge divides and helping them to see each other's view of the world. 
Because once you see the other's view of the world that makes sense to them, there is something to talk about. Yeah. And there's suddenly no judgment. Mm. I think I think I'm not going to say there's no judgment, but there's sort of somewhere to stand that isn't judgment. Mm. Yeah. You could you can stand on That's a space I mean, of yeah. curiosity mm -hmm. rather than stand in a space of judgment. Yeah. Yeah. And starting from the point of or from the worldview that every human being does things for some reason it makes sense to them mm. and maybe their mind is distorted yes but still in their mind and their worldview it makes sense and then it's just about understanding what does it mean to make sense mm. for them that's an entire new life philosophy <laughs> i think i suppose that that is what clean is at one level it's it's a philosophy a bunch of us who were sort of leaders, for want of a better word, in the world of clean language, went, we went on a, on, a, on a holiday together with the idea that we would work out with, a, with a, the clean language community and all sorts of things like that. But nothing, nothing like that actually emerged. But what we noticed was that during the holiday, we hardly ever heard a clean language question being asked. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> <laughs> but what we did do was we all shared the philosophy that it was okay for the other person to be who they were. Mm -hmm. There was not much point in us standing around judging each other, and we could be curious about each other. And that philosophy is a very comfortable place to be. So if I understand you correctly, you basically went to the point where it was clear that this non-judgment space was existing so that you didn't have to be so strict with the application of the clean language in the way mm. you communicated with each other. Yes. Nice. So the questions are, are a means to an end. They're not the end in itself. Yeah. And I think if you know the language, then very often then you don't even need to ask the question. It's just a glance. You look at the person mm. and they know exactly what you're <laughs> about to ask because it's yes. basically just a curiosity and giving them permission to explore mm. and share more about this one thought. Yes. So tell us more about this process. <laughs> so because you said clean language is a process, and now you said clean language is a philosophy. Mm. I also hear clean language is maybe a way of living. <laughs> <laughs> Which, and it, it all sounds a bit highfalutin and uh, over the top if I say that it's a, it's a philosophy, it's a way of living. I think that clean language can be used at multiple levels. Mm -hmm. At its simplest, clean language can be used to enhance a process that you already have. So a few of us have experimented with combining clean language and liberating structures, for example, mm -hmm. with some success. So Elise Keith is doing this big experiment where she's testing out certain facilitation processes in creativity. Yes. And we've Please put... Keith. Yes. Yeah. We've put one together which combines liberating structures and clean language. Mm -hmm. So I can't remember the exact detail. It's written down. And, ooh, everybody who's got groups to play with, you can volunteer to be part of this big experiment. They want to test, test this 500 times with 500 groups. New rules for work. We put it yeah. in show notes. Yes. Yeah. So you can test that out. So there's a process there which combines liberating structures and clean language. And The bits of clean language which are included there are a curiosity about metaphor and a couple of clean language questions. So clean language, one of its original features, which is, as far as I know, still original in the sense that nobody else seems to be doing it, is that it really grasps the fact that human beings think in metaphor. Mm -hmm. The metaphors that spill out in our language are the result of the metaphors in our thoughts. It's not that we sit around thinking, oh, what, though sometimes we do, of course, what would be a good metaphor for this thing that I'm trying to describe? So just before this, I was working on some training materials about creating stripy sessions for if you're going to do something online in which you're introducing an idea, you want to say a bit about it, then get people with their hands on the 
idea to do something with it, make it relevant to them, and then debrief about what they've come up with, mm-hmm. and then introduce the next bit. So it's stripey. And that mm. metaphor of stripey wasn't mine. Somebody else came up with that metaphor, but I thought, brilliant. It's a really good way of expressing this idea of switching from activity to activity to activity quickly in an online session to enable people to stay focused. So sometimes we think of metaphors deliberately, but much more often they spill out accidentally. They're just part of our speech. Mm-hmm. And you can use that to really find out what people mean by what they say at some level. So if I say metaphors spill out, at some level, I must be thinking of metaphors being in some kind of container and it comes out. Yeah. So if you were curious about how that all worked, you could ask me about the container. And yeah. I might not have ever been aware that I was thinking about metaphors as being in a container until you ask the questions. Mm. Because so much of our thinking is unconscious. And it almost sounds as if it requires deep listening and then a, I wouldn't call it decision, but it's almost like zooming into one aspect of what has been said. Because I could ask you about the container. I could also ask you about, so what happens if it spills out? On what Mm -hmm. does it spill? Exactly. So there are clean language questions to do that. So you could ask, and and when it spills out, whereabouts does it spill out? Mm. And when it spills out, then what happens? So yes, as the facilitator, you are choosing what to ask about. And that is influence. You're not not influencing because you are directing the person's attention to aspects of what they've said. And I think you're, yes, you're influencing, but you're influencing without spoiling. (laughs) Now I understand where the clean comes from, because I'm not Mm. adding my own stuff. Exactly. And it almost feels like an invitation to them to explore their own minds and own ideas. So it's a gift. Yeah. Now, if instead of asking, and when it spills out, whereabouts does it spill out? You said, oh, metaphors spill out. Yes, I've got a bit like that. I know how metaphors spill out. Mine are a bit like that. That's the opposite. That's and then the inter- conversation is over. Yeah, because there's, you know, you've, you've stopped being curious about how mm. theirs are spilling and you're only talking about how yours are spilling. Um, yes. And I wonder to what extent it's, um, it's a natural force in us humans that when we hear something that is similar to something that we have in our mind – We have this urge to, oh, yes, we are just the same. We're so connected. So this urge to belong and to connect and to make friends is so strong that we want to avoid at all costs that your spilling is different from my spilling. No, no, it's all the same. So it's all the same. Everybody's the same. But it's not the case that we have to be the same in order to make friends. And especially in the... In the context of a workshop and group work, we are living from not being the same because that's where creativity, novelty, innovation comes from. That's where the friction comes from so that we can then, so this tension release that we constantly play with in facilitation. So basically, if I understand you correctly, with the questions and zooming in to understand better, we are creating a tension, the confrontation with differences Mm. to then create a release where we're like, okay, so what does it then mean to all of us, given that all these differences, so what does it mean and what can we do with it? I I think that's a really nice way of describing it because all of these differences, it needs to be okay for there to be huge amounts of differences. Mm. If the only way we could be friends was to all be the same, the effect of that on not only innovation and creativity, but on inclusion of diverse voices would be appalling. You know, we we can't have to pretend to be all the same in order to be okay with each other. And it's funny, I think that's also where most of the conflicts come from, that we assume or believe that we are the same, and then we have expectations. And if the person doesn't live up to our expectations, then we take it personally. 
mm. because <laughs> we are so much the same. So if we are so much the same, how dare you? You didn't buy me yeah. flowers. You should have done. You should have. You should have. And nobody ever says. Yeah, it's on the so, side uh, assumptions. Yeah. So my colleague Caitlin Walker has done some really interesting stuff about getting people to say out loud, and she has a model she calls the clean feedback model. Where she says, which breaks the thing down into evidence, inference, and impact. So evidence, she says, say what you saw or heard. So I noticed that you did not bring me flowers when I expected them. The meaning that I made from that is that you no longer love me. And the impact of that is I have packed my suitcase and I should be leaving on the next train. Or I noticed that you didn't bring me flowers when I expected you to. The meaning I make is you must have had a really, really busy day. The impact on me is that I've made you dinner, warmed your slippers and poured you a drink. Beautiful. So the same evidence can have a very different meaning. And once you know what the meaning you're making is, then you can understand why it's having the impact. Mm. But similar as with so much of the stuff from the clean language, it's about slowing things down enough so you can make sense of their world and also make sense of your own world. Yeah. And giving the other party the chance to understand your world. Mm. Or at least to see it. And that's not to say that those of us who learn clean language do this all the time and we, we never get into conflicts and we never get upset with each other. <laughs> <laughs> If only you remain human. <laughs> But hopefully, before conflicts become catastrophic, we're able to slow ourselves down and say, ah, I can see what's going on here. Yeah. I, I was jumping to a conclusion. I was making a meaning from yeah. something that didn't mean that. Now, I distracted it... us onto a, onto a slightly different topic from process, but I hope, um, I hope this is useful. Absolutely. And it just shows the level of self awareness that. Um... I assume is then part of the training to slow down and be aware of our language and how it impacts mm. not, not only the others, but also ourselves, right? Yeah. Words create and, worlds. Indeed. And of course, clean language at one level, it's a philosophy and it's awareness of other and the fact that other people do their thinking differently. It's awareness of metaphor. And at one level, it's a set of questions that anybody can use. You look them up on the internet. You can, I, I've got a, a, a spinner on the Reese mm -hmm. McCann website that uh, you can click the button on the website and it will call you off a random clean language question to ask about anything. <laughs> you know, you can just randomize them. Mm -hmm. And at some level they are useful. Yeah. But this this deeper philosophy that I think is the most interesting aspect, even though that deeper philosophy is not unique to clean language and That deeper philosophy, I think, is shared by most facilitators, and yet they don't realize how deep that philosophy could go if they were willing to let it go. What remains your number one facilitation challenge? Oh, mine is that I, I, I get utterly exhausted whenever I'm in a room with lots of people, whether I'm facilitating or not. So for me, I find it really, really challenging to facilitate whole day events in the room because I just get so tired. Introvert. Yeah. Mm. Introvert and I, I self-identify as highly highly sensitive in that in that uh, meaning of the the book, highly sensitive people. Yeah. I'm sure I'm not highly sensitive in all so sorts of other meanings, but I'm somewhat sensitive to noise and uh, external stimuli. And that was why I got into facilitating online. Because what's brilliant about this is I can switch you off. <laughs> I can relate to that. I um, I absorb energy in the room a lot, and I love online facilitation. Mm. Also, in the breaks, you have the break for yourself. Nobody is coming to talk to you. <laughs> exactly. But I'm going to say out loud that the clean language facilitators, loads of them are extroverts, and they do absorb energy from groups. There's no particular association between introversion and clean language. I've tested this out over some years. So a lot of people don't have that challenge at all. They use clean language all the time and they and they love being in the room with buzzing groups of people. And I think it might be even more important to learn the concept of clean language and be aware of the impact as an extrovert. 
because extroverts tend to use more words to explain what they're saying and they mm -hmm. tend to even be more on the side of, oh, I want to connect, I want to be one of you and I want to be agreeable. Mm -hmm. Then falling into the trap of assuming that we all mean the same instead yeah. of being curious. Yeah, I'm not sure how, how closely related extroversion and agreeableness are, but they are certainly in the same kind of general ballpark. Mm -hmm. And if people believe that in order to be agreeable, they have to be the same as, then adapting to clean language might be challenging for them. Yeah. But actually adapting to facilitation might be challenging for them because we need that tension that you were talking about a moment ago. Yeah. We have to allow for people to be different or the whole game doesn't work. Yeah. And the entire thing that it's not about us, but it's about the group. So mm. leaving the ego outside. From your experience, what makes a workshop fail? Hmm. I can't think of many examples of failure in workshops. Because something in that Jennifer Degant, another clean language person, always used to say, always, always says still, I imagine I haven't seen her for a while. Well, something will happen. And there's a saying that whatever happened is the only thing that could have happened. Mm -hmm. Open space. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so if something happened, which wasn't what you expected, does that count as failure? It's just something different happened to what you expected. Mm. Yeah. So I'm, Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that there is such a thing as a workshop that can fail. And it's... I suppose there is uh, online. If the internet fails or Zoom fails, then the workshop fails. But mm. <laughs> Yeah. And I just wondered whether the concept of failure is actually possible in the world of clean language. No, I don't think it is. Because yeah. it's just not something I ever think about. And I think it is that, well, something will happen. Whatever happens is the only thing that could have happened. And then it's an iteration to the next stage mm. instead of... Yeah. And it doesn't mean it always feels like that in the moment. <laughs> <laughs> When it's, oh my God, it, the boss is, is throwing a temper tantrum over there and, the, <laughs> and all the rest of it. I mean, yeah, so I, I did a, a really interesting in the room workshop not so long ago and the, and... Uh, it was a really interesting tension in that the senior management team, except for the big boss, basically asked us to facilitate their away days. The big boss had to be persuaded to let us do it. And there was a really big difference between the big boss and the senior team. And the tension was absolutely enormous. And you can imagine, I mean, luckily, this was a group of uh, L&D people. And I was doing my best to hold the tension, as were we, we set ourselves up as a witchy square with uh, one of the people at each corner. And yeah, we were doing our best to hold the tension, but the, the big boss didn't like it one little bit. Until the end? No, she still didn't like it. But, you know, maybe you're not always going to end with everybody happy. That's not my job. Yes. My job is not to make everybody happy. My job is to get the group to do the work they've asked me to help them to do. And one of the things that they wanted to do was to make sure that the differences were clear and out there. Mm. And that doesn't mean that by the end of the thing, we tied it all up in a bow and posted them back to the management. That's not how it worked. And that's very interesting because the fact that there is the big boss not wanting to be there and not wanting you to facilitate. I mean, this adds a very interesting dynamic to the group. Mm, yeah. And there are things like leadership bias. So obviously the, the group still decided that they will do it anyway. So how did you, and you said that you held the tension Didn't you want to resolve it? Or how can you how can you yeah, I was, I was how scared can you to productively death work with a yeah. group with such a tension in the room? So this is a question. So when you know you've got tension going into the thing, do you just turn down the gig? What if my friend Martin, who was doing all the peace development stuff, he knows he's got tension. He doesn't turn down the gig. Mm. He puts on his big boy boots and he gets on with it. Because unless we can start to talk about difference and tension. We're just sweeping it under the carpet. So I'm not going to say that that piece of work with the big boss and the, the senior team was the world's greatest piece of work. 
maybe I failed. I don't know. But if the goal was, and I was told the goal was, to make sure that everybody knew about the tension, that we could start to talk about the tension, we understood what was different and who, who what was going on, well, then we succeeded. Yeah. And again, it's coming back to the principles of clean language. It's accepting that her behavior makes sense from her point of view. Mm. And that it's not on us to change this behavior or this rationality, but to go with, along with it and maybe to develop some curiosity to understand mm. where this is coming from or what the impact of that is. Yeah. And we don't necessarily have to accept what she does, mm. but we have to accept that it makes sense to her. Yeah. Just as our man shooting the six-year-old, we don't have to accept that he's good or that that was the right thing to do but we do have to accept that at some level it made sense to him. And once we get curious, now, luckily it's not my job to get curious about the, the man shooting the six-year-old, but some probation officer somewhere will have that job to get curious about what they were up to and why they did what they did. And that will help to come up with suitable ways forward. And similarly, if you get curious about the big boss, why on earth are they doing these bonkers things? Why are they behaving so irrationally? Why do they not do it the way we've always done it? Get curious about it. Then you've at least got some chance of finding a way to live with it. Whereas if you just say, well, they're just stupid, they're mad, they're insane, then you, there's nothing to do. There's nowhere to go with that. Yeah, it's a dead end. And I even wonder in the example with the big boss, by I think... The vast majority of human beings, we like to be witnessed and to be curious about. We love talking about ourselves. So the moment the big boss realized that, okay, they, they allow to be different. It's okay. They have permission not to wanting to be there. And someone is curious to understand why that is, that it might even actually open their heart and be more willing to find a common ground. It might work like that for some people and it doesn't have to yeah sometimes you don't necessarily get what you wanted which would be lovely you know it'd be great if they suddenly developed the perfect self self-awareness and they realized got curious about why do these people want to want to do this why when it's all so uncomfortable that wasn't what happened mm. but it might happen in the future or it might happen another day yeah or maybe in another context maybe mm. it did shift something but just not for that group Maybe yeah. the leader went home and suddenly <laughs> acted differently. That's the beauty of facilitation and also the sad part that we don't know we don't know the real impact mm. of work. Mm. It's true. Thank you. Yes, it's don't have I just realized how much it's inside of me, this seeking harmony. I love harmony. I love the happy end. And then the leader who found Found their place with a group and they all agreed and lived happily ever after. <laughs> <laughs> the world isn't like that. Yeah. And if as a facilitator, you believe that you have to end up with a happy ending, the world isn't going to fit in with your plan. And we will influence in a negative way. Now we're coming full circle back to where we started our conversation. Me having this One, that means I have expectations on the group. This means that I will judge them and that if they're not fulfilling this expectation, they won't be good enough. And hence, even without using words, clean or, or dirty language, I will influence mm -hmm. them. Yeah. And yeah. if one of your jobs is to make sure we finish on time, for example, mm -hmm. that will sometimes mean, as I look at the clock right now, That will sometimes mean that people are going to go away dissatisfied. So if people joined this podcast thinking that you're going to get the complete unadulterated, unexpurgated clean language process for working with a group, sorry, ain't going to happen because <laughs> I have to go out. I, I, I can't continue the conversation indefinitely. And that's part of the facilitator's job is to start and finish on time, do what can be done within the time and then say, right, well, Given we've got to where we've got to, now what happens next? And what happens next is you will send me the link to the full process and I will put it in the show. 
<laughs> I'll send you a couple of links to different things that people can learn. But I think that we've talked about the key elements, the philosophy, the questions, the metaphors. Yeah. And the fact that, you know, whatever happens is the only thing that could have happened. Something will happen. I yeah. think there's some really interesting stuff within what we've talked about. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for staying tuned and for listening until the very end. I hope that you found the inspiration and the wisdom that you are looking for. And I hope that you will subscribe to the show so that you never miss any of the interviews with in another inspiring facilitator from across the world. I am devoted to continue this podcast and to deliver weekly an episode that maintains the quality that you expect and you deserve. And if you would like to help me to maintain this quality and to keep the podcast free, please help us visit workshops.work slash support to make a small donation to keep the podcast free. Thank you so much. I hope to be in your ears next week.